Okay, so the main focus for today is looking at how to compare trends in data or to compare categories or other things in our data set over time or across space or across different dimensions in our data. Um, and there are a whole bunch of different ways of doing this. Um, you saw different examples in your readings. Um, some of them you've already been exposed to. Um, you, you read one article about lollipop charts and it, it walked you through an example of making them. Hopefully you looked through the code there and you said, I understand what's going on because they're using geom point range. They're using regular ggplot stuff that I've been using. Um, and so that's cool. Um, this is from this is a plot from uh, some of my research that shows um, different organizations and what they do um, in in the survey that I ran. And so you can compare um, kind of the different types of contentiousness of these organizations and how many um, organizations responded to my survey. And so even though this is just a bar chart or a lollipop chart, it still helps us see comparison or make comparisons. So we can see that most of the organizations that responded to my survey here um, are low contention organizations um, that deal with education and development. Um, the biggest high contention organization type was human rights organizations that work on like um, human rights abuses. And so they're kind of the, the third most popular. And so even with this, this simple bar chart or simple lollipop chart, you can start making comparisons between things, um, which is nice. But um, if I'm trying to do a whole bunch of comparisons, so right now this is like 20-ish categories, and it's helpful, but then like trying to see the difference between culture and religion and research organizations, those are, I think those are all the same. Um, democracy assistance and children and youth, those are just barely off from each other. Um, but this is also showing numbers at one point in time. So there's not really a lot of variation here that we need to worry about showing. But if you're trying to show lots of data over time across a whole bunch of different categories, then you'll end up with really, really complicated plots. Um, so if you remember from last session, we talked about scatter plot matrices where you can have a whole bunch of information shoved into this little box, but then it's really hard to find any trends, especially if you're trying to do like correlations uh, like a, a correlation scatter plot matrix um, for different years, that's going to be really hard to see. Um, and so one alternative to this and um, is something called a spark line or using something called small multiples. And you read this on Edward Tufte's website. Um, this is one of the things he's most famous for is this idea of spark lines at small multiples. And so this is one of the charts that you looked at. And this shows um, childhood mortality rates. Um, over time, I think is what it was. Yeah, should be childhood mortality. I'm missing the, the, the title here. But the, the interesting thing about this is that, yes, it's really, it's, it's not really ugly. It's, it's just, there's no numbers here. Um, so you can't really tell um, kind of what this means that Guatemala was, had a dip in their mortality rates or uh, they're improving. Um, like all these countries are improving. Um, but you that's all that it's really showing. <clears throat> but that's okay, because ultimately all we care about is the ability to make comparisons rapidly across these different countries. And so in general, you can see that all countries are kind of moving similarly together. Um, but some of these countries have interesting stories that are hidden in them. So Micronesia right here had this weird little dip and then they're back on track. That could have just been a reporting error or it could have been something else that's causing kind of a decline in human development standards. If you look at Libya, um, it was growing and then there was a huge drop. Um, that could have been like the revolution in 2011 that was causing something to happen. If you look at Haiti, there's a huge drop. That's probably the earthquake that happened. Um, and so you can, you can tell all sorts of stories here. Um, just looking at these plots briefly, um, even though there's no numbers, so here's Iraq, there's the US invasion of Iraq, and then it bumps back up. Um, ultimately, it's okay that these plots don't have numbers. That's not their purpose. Their purpose is to let us make rapid comparisons across a whole bunch of different countries across time all at once. Um, and then like, we can tell lots, lots more stories here than if we had um, kind of one giant plot with 150 lines on it, that's going to be impossible to interpret. But something like this is helpful because it is super condensed information um, that is kind of in the small multiples situation here. Another example is something that 538 has been doing for the past few years. Um, they have a website, if you click on that link there, it shows Trump's approval ratings compared to all the past presidents at this point in time. 
Um, and so you have these mini charts here. They, there are scales on this one here. Um, and if you hover over these different points, it'll, it'll show kind of um, the net approval rating and net disapproval rating for different presidents over time. But instead of overlaying um, Trump's approval ratings with all the different presidents on one single plot, what it does is separates it out to just pairs. And so this is Trump Obama, Trump Bush, Trump Clinton, etc. And so it's just smaller versions of that same plot that's repeated a lot. And because of that, we can make faster comparisons. So we can follow Trump's net approval rating and compare it to Obama's. We can see the 9-11 spike in George Bush's approval ratings and then the drop. Um, and then some other spike that happened 810 days into the, into the administration. Um, and so you can kind of follow those different, those different trends um, and make comparisons not only between Obama and Trump, but also between um, George Bush and Obama and Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter. You can make all sorts of comparisons because we've simplified the data and condensed it into these smaller multiples here. Um, another good example of this is this plot here. Um, you're familiar with faceting. We've been using facet wrap throughout this semester so far. Um, there's a R package called GeoFacet that lets you facet by things, but instead of doing like a grid, um, it will facet in specific shapes. And so we can facet by the shape of the United States. And so like Florida's right here and Maine's right there. And we have Washington, Oregon, California, and Nevada over on the West Coast here. And so this is nice because this is another example of small multiples. This is the unemployment rate from 2000 to 2016. And so it's, it does have numbers here. We can see the years, we can see kind of unemployment rate, but what's most important is we can see different trends really quickly. Um, we can see in North Dakota, even though there was the Great Recession in 2008, they were relatively unaffected by it. They had very low unemployment the whole time. Um, other states like Michigan, they were really hard hit by the recession in 2008. So if you look right there, um, they had a very high peak in unemployment. Um, you can see other states where there was a high peak. Nevada had a high peak. Um, and if you just look across like this column here, Utah didn't have a very high peak. Kansas was relatively fine with the Great Recession. North Carolina had a high, was, was hard hit. Georgia wasn't hit as hard as Alabama, but West Virginia was kind of better off than Georgia. Um, and you can make these comparisons really quickly here. Um, I guess it's most dramatic up here in the Dakotas and Montana. They weren't really affected by the Great Recession at all um, compared to other places like Nevada, Arizona, Florida was bad. Um, and so you can make those comparisons really quickly because we have these small multiples here. Um, another thing that we can do is instead of having a graph at all, we, or like a plot area at all, we can use something called a spark line that's a very, very minimalist version of all of this, where it essentially translates data into words and puts it at kind of a word level. Um, so here's an example from actual text that exists out in the world where you can say, um, so this is talking about like Premier League rankings with the Tottenham Spurs, um, hot spurs, you can say that they started at eighth and then they moved up to second in the Premier League over the past 24 years, but they actually have this chart here. So they're showing that they were in eighth and then they went down and then they went up and then down and up and up and up. And over the past few years, they've been high in the rankings. Now they're, whatever year this was, I think this is from 2017, they were in second place. And so you can actually see that here. Or you can use it for like a miniature um, bar plot here. So this is showing Alibaba's stock pricing. Um, it starts out at 93 and then it, it drops down at this point, but then it starts increasing. So you can actually see that kind of in the middle of the text. Or you can see the 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 bounce in the FTSE 100, which is a European stock market index. Um, it went up because of Brexit initially. It's gone down since. But you can use this dot plot here to, to trace those trends. Um, and so this kind of thing is kind of rare to see in the wild. There are ways of doing it. There's actually a free font that you can download um, that I will link to in the course material for today um, that you can use with like HTML and CSS to encode actual graphics within like um, web-based text. Um, you can also use it in Word. You have to do some tricky font settings. Um, you can use it in InDesign and Illustrator. Um, you can't use this kind of stuff in R. Um, to do this kind of stuff in R, the trick is you just make a regular ggplot and save it with ggsave, but you just make it really, really tiny. You make like the height be like a tenth of an inch 
um, and then you can place that in your text. Um, and that's kind of R's way of getting around it. Um, so even though this isn't super widespread in actual text, it is widespread um, in devices. So the Apple Watch, uh, one of the things that it, it started doing was adding these little tiny spark lines to its screen, kind of replicating uh, hospital monitors. These right here in hospital monitors are just spark lines. They don't have actual numbers on them. You can see like blood pressure and uh, blood saturation levels and heart rate. Um, they have single numbers here, but there's no historical numbers because that's not important. What's really important is just kind of seeing the trends. You can see that the saturation level here is good. Um, the blood pressure is good. Um, if there are any weird spikes, um, then you'd be able to see those trends pretty quickly. Um, and so you don't need the full data. You don't need all of the numbers in a data set to be able to show um, trends and make comparisons over time. You can just do a very minimalist line or a very minimalist bar chart, and that works just as well. Um, so another way, the final way of making comparisons here is to use something called slope graphs, where um, what we can do is show the change between two groups over time just by isolating those two groups. And so we repeat those groups on the different y axes here. And so this is kind of a, a fun thing. This is by Stephanie Evergreen, who writes books on how to do data visualization stuff in Excel. Um, she had this as a New Year's card a few years ago. Um, so you can see that she wants the grumps next year to go down and pure joy, goodwill, and cheer to go up next year. Hooray. Um, you do see these in the wild. This is from a New York Times article in 2009 showing the change in infant mortality statistics and rankings. So back in 1960, Sweden had the highest, had the best infant mortality rates um, in the world. Um, and in 1964, or in, in 2004, they're still up at the top, but they were, they were passed by Japan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So they moved down the rankings a little bit. Um, but if you look, you can see that Singapore went way up. They were down here um, near the middle of the list, but by the time they got to 2004, they're at the top of the list. And so you can use these lines to trace changes in ranks. Um, and the steeper the line is, the greater the change is. If you have something like Costa Rica, where you're basically going from here, you went down one spot in the rankings, that's not a huge change. The slope is very small. If you're something like the United States, we were up here in 1960. In 2004, we dropped down to the level of Slovakia and Poland and Chile and Gang. Um, and you can see that change pretty rapidly. You can encode other information on here. Um, if you notice, there are three different colors. Um, there's some grayer. Um, these gray lines here show that infant mortality went or death rates decreased um, and got worse potentially. Um, the green lines mean that infant rates got or infant death rates went up. And then the United States is colored red is just kind of the highlight. That's the main thing that they want to, to point out in this graph. And so they use color. The designers here used color to point out different trends. Um, but you can you can easily make all sorts of comparisons here just by um, looking at kind of the slope there between these two columns. You can have multiple columns. Um, this is from um, one of Edward Tufte's books where he introduces this idea of slope graphs. Um, on this side here, you have a table of cancer survival rates over time. And so you can technically say like the five-year survival rate for prostate cancer is 98%, and then it goes 95, 87, 81. And you can go through the table and figure that out. But figuring out changes in uh, survival rates and which ones are bad and which ones start dropping off really fast um, that's really hard to do with the table. But if you look over at the slope graph, you can see those changes. So like if you have thyroid cancer, you have basically a 96% chance of survival across all of time here. That's not going to change. Um, if you have something like breast cancer or Hodgkin's disease, um, your survival rate at the beginning starts off fairly high, but then look at breast cancer, it drops down fairly quickly from 86 to 95. Uh, laryngeal cancer down here goes from 69, and by the time you get to the 20-year survival rate, you're in like the 30s. Um, that would show up over here. It shows up as 37.8%, but you can't see that in the table. Um, having it as a slope graph like this shows that change in, in mortality rate or in survival rate a lot better. Um, and so this is kind of a faster way of, of visualizing the, the changes in rates and comparing the changes in rates over time. Um, a final version of this is something called a bump chart, which is essentially a slope graph, but just with lots of columns. Um, so one, one example of this is, this is the 2018 
um, Winter Olympics medal count. And so you can see as the, as the competition went on, it lasted 16 days. This is the rankings of different countries in the medal rankings, like the, by the number of medals they've earned. So on, by the first day, Germany um, had the most medals um, and they maintained that ranking up until day eight. And then they dropped down to second place in day nine when they were overtaken by Norway, um, who started off back in fifth place, but you can kind of trace their path over time and they end up in first. You can trace the United States. We ended up in fourth. Um, our worst day was day 11, where we were in sixth place with the medal count. Our best day was day five, when we had third place. Back on day one, we weren't even ranked because um, Germany and the Netherlands and Norway were winning all of the medals and South Korea. Um, so you can trace each of these countries' kind of trajectories throughout the Olympics um, using this bump chart here. And you can make comparisons across the different countries and across the the different days of the competition. So there's a whole bunch of different ways of visualizing comparisons. Um, in the example and in the assignment for today, you'll get practice making these, um, and hopefully it should be fun. So let's head on over there after we talk about reproducible examples.